Hi, everyone. Um, let's start by talking about chai, or chaya as we call it in my family. And I know that's maybe a slightly left field way to begin. I promised you this talk on the nation, and we will get there. Um, but let's go with this for now. And so cha chaya, chaya is tea, for those of you who don't. Chaya is tea. Sometimes a couple of spices mixed in. And I imagine that everyone here loves tea, isn't it? We British love tea, hallmark of Britishness, nation of tea drinkers, all that kind of stuff. Um, and to be fair, I think plenty of people are quite fond of chai as well. Though often, and quite sadly, in the form of that demented drink that Starbucks has made famous, the chai tea latte. But, but that's fine, that's cool. What's also cool is that neither tea nor spices are indigenous to the UK, are they? And by cool, I of course mean slightly suspicious. <laughs> by slightly suspicious, I mean that tea and spices only ended up in the UK because of its previous adventures, shall we say, in India. <laughs> and what I mean by that, what I mean by that is you can't really account for the way that tea has become representative of national culture in the UK without also telling the story of British colonialism. But very often, that is exactly how it's told. That is how it's depicted. That is how it's talked about. And I think that tells us two things about nations and nationalism. So I promised you we'd get back to this topic. It tells us two things about nations and nationalism. The first is that these things that we think of as markers of culture and national belonging, they don't fall from the sky. They're actively created. The second thing is that these things around which feelings of national belonging coalesce, they don't correspond with the borders of a particular political unit. They don't correspond with the borders of a state. If a certain cultural practice gives you claim to a certain identity, it doesn't matter where you happen to live. If drinking tea is a cornerstone of being British, it doesn't matter if you happen to live in Oxford or Oman, right? So keep that, keep that thought in mind as we just make our way through this nationalism business. Nationalism, unfortunately, is in the ascendancy as a resurgent force of our current political moment. In fact, no, it's probably already ascended, seated quite comfortably on its perch at the top of the political force charts. And as a political force, nationalism is extraordinarily invested in this idea of generating outsider figures, threats, foreigners, dangers, and the fiction, the snake oil that is at Heron's pedal is that if only you can expunge or deport or kill all of these problem elements, the nation can once again be restored to its pristine state, populated only with the members who truly belong. And that's a fantasy. It's a political fantasy. You don't have to look very far to see that it's quite a contagious political fantasy, but it's a fantasy nonetheless. But there's a secondary way of dealing with the nation that's proving to be increasingly seductive. And that's basically the claim that the nation could be this repository of collective belonging instead of expressing feelings of aversion. And if you happen to be an undergraduate on a political theory type, of course, it's normally around this point that you meet a person called Benedict Anderson and the term imagine political community. So Anderson writes this book in the 1980s called Imagine Communities, and his big claim is that nations they don't fall from the sky, they're actively created, they're an imagined political community. And they're created through language. And for Anderson, because they're created through language, shared language, theoretically anyone could become a member of the nation. Nations are fundamentally inclusive, as far as he's concerned. And many of his other contemporaries were writing with some disagreements over you know, exactly with what instrument one could stake a claim to belonging, but they all generally agreed on what we call the liberal theory of the nation. Now, the liberal theory of the nation is basically this claim that the nation is this quite benign basin of belonging and common culture that people just want to belong to. People want to be part of something larger than themselves. They want to belong to it. It's expressed in a kind of, I don't hate anyone, I just love my country, I'm proud of my country. There's surely nothing wrong with that type of sentiment. Well, I happen to think there's something wrong with that. Let me tell you why. In 2020, the New York Times ran an op-ed 
in the run-up to the US presidential election. It was titled, Don't Let Nationalists Speak for the Nation. And its main claim was that the antidote to nationalism is patriotism. Express your belonging, love that nation, and all that kind of stuff. It's sort of Benedict Anderson repackaged for 2020. But in the same decade that Anderson was... Anderson and his friends were writing all of these books about the nation as this repository of culture and belonging, there was another book that took a rather different standpoint. And that was Paul Gilroy's Ain't No Black in the Union Jack. And Gilroy's point in that book was that contra the liberal theory of the nation, there's actually a racial politics to the nation. So say to be British is to enjoy a cup of tea. We're back to this tea business again. To be British is to enjoy a cup of tea. And those who don't belong a little bit less. You're a little bit less authentically British. But the problem, the problem is that no one actually knows what everyone else's beverage preferences really are. I mean, you might know what some of your friends like to drink. Definitely don't know what all of them like. It might have changed over the years. Certainly don't know what random strangers like. Even here, contra to what I initially said, the number of people who don't like tea is not zero. We don't know the exact number, but it's a non-zero number. So then the question really becomes who or which communities are imagined to not enjoy a cup of tea? Who are these communities that are imagined to be unable to fit in to this nation of tea drinkers because they don't share cultural practice? And for drinking tea, you can substitute all manners of cultural practice and all manners of imagination. And if we go back to Gilroy, Gilroy's point was that the way these categories are imagined, who's fully British, who's a little bit less British, who's completely un-British, the way these categories are imagined can be inflected by race. They very often are. And to gloss over that would be to succumb to what my friend and the scholar of nationalism, Shiva Mohan Vallavan, calls the complacency around the nation. And it's a complacency that arises from a simple misunderstanding, he says. It's a misunderstanding of the nation as a politics of belonging rather than a politics of enmity. And I think Valu is right. I think part of the reason patriotism and belonging can seem like such appealing and harmless ideas is that the vast majority of the time we experience them interpersonally. You share feelings of amity and love with friends and family, the communities that you like, people that you share kind of heritage with and certain hobbies with, I don't know, playing tennis or collecting stamps or playing Pokemon Go. That's where you find love and amity. The nation, however, is not your friend. The relationship with the nation is not an interpersonal relationship. It's a political relationship. Take, for example, me. I, I'm a football tragic, and for my sins, a Manchester United supporter. And I think there's a massive difference between a sense of affection and adherence being directed towards Man United and a sense of affection and, and adherence being directed towards a nation state. One, operates in conjunction with a political formation. The other, well, sadly, it struggles for any kind of formation on the football field, let alone a political one. And a football club in Manchester is not a nation state. Well, the red one isn't anyway. Hey, one for the football fans here. They're not called the citizens for nothing. I think at this point, it might help to think about different types of belonging. The vast majority of the forms of belonging that we experience, it can be grouped under a cultural heading. The kinds of belonging that the nation asks of you, however, is a political form of belonging. And it can be used to legitimize political decisions and political choices. It can be used to legitimize things that you and I cannot do in our daily lives. You cannot deport someone because you don't like what they're doing in Pokemon Go. The nation can do that. And so we're told that we belong to a nation and its culture, and therefore we should feel some kind of affection and belonging towards it. We're told that that's natural, but it isn't natural. 
It isn't natural at all that your form of your sense of affection and your sense of belonging should be directed towards a political unit that governs you. Because there are places where these political identities and cultural identities don't fit. Take the colonies, for example, or former colonies. And I'll tell you a story. On the 23rd of March, 2015, just as David Cameron was announcing he would not be seeking a third term as Prime Minister, Sheila Anti receives a call from her mum. And her mum says, our Prime Minister is dead. Sheila Anti is quite surprised. Surely this ought to have been reported. She asks her mum, is David Cameron dead? And her mum says, no, 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 not David Cameron. Lee Kuan Yew is dead. Now, you might have already guessed this, but Lee Kuan Yew wasn't the British Prime Minister in 2015. <laughs> Nor was he the British Prime Minister at any point in time for that matter, though he was educated in the halls of many a great prime, a UK Prime Minister, your great rivals, Cambridge. But Lee Kuan Yew was the, the first Prime Minister of independent Singapore. Singapore that used to be a British colony. And at that time, until it became independent, Sheila and T's parents worked for the British as part of this massive Indian Malayali labor force that essentially ran the British naval base in Sambawa, the north of Singapore. So they lived and worked there, and after decolonization, these workers were offered the opportunity to move to London to settle. And at the time, Singapore's future as a newly independent country appeared rather precarious. So Sheila and his parents decided, with a heavy heart, but they decided that for practical reasons, they would move and they were settled in East Ham, in what used to be the political metropole, right, in the UK. They were settled in East Ham along with many of their former co-workers. And if you go to East Ham today, you'll see this great Malayali community, all of the uncles and aunties whose parents or grandparents used to work in Sambawang Naval Base in Singapore. And if you speak to these uncles and aunties, they've only got fond memories of their time in what used to be their home. They tell you about the places where they used to live, what they used to do for work, the people they used to hang out with, the things they used to do. And it's quite clear that they've got this massive amount of affinity for Singapore, even though they no longer live there. So much so that even after 50 years, Sheila Auntie's mum still referred to its first prime minister, Lee Kuan Yew, as our prime minister. And I think the word our, it's doing a lot of work there. Even after half a century, she'd lived here for 50 years at that point. After half a century, she still regarded herself as part of the Singaporean community. Equally, to Singapore, Sheila Auntie's mom no longer belonged. And she didn't have the right political affinity. She was a British citizen, a foreigner. But it's also the same woman who lived and worked in Singapore for 30 years, at least a third of her life, shared the cultural practices, spoke the languages, followed the traditions. And there's a disjuncture here. Something doesn't quite fit. But that is what the nation can do to you. Whatever feelings you have towards the nation, they aren't automatically reciprocated because you can be displaced at any point in time, regardless of how you feel, unilaterally, because the nation isn't your friend, it's a political unit. And my point today was simply to explain the ways in which I think the nation operates in ways that don't correspond to the sort of interpersonal relationships that we have. The kind of belonging, the kind of, in, the, the kind of belonging that the nation asks of you does not correspond to the sorts of belonging we experience in our daily lives. Those of you who follow tennis, and in particular the fortunes of Andy Murray, will be familiar with the quip. Andy is British when he wins and Scottish when he loses, <laughs> right? And I think there's more than a grain of truth there. When Andy is a favorable, even useful national subject, Andy is beckoned into the fold. And when he isn't, well, then he's cut adrift, swiftly, immediately banished to the Scottish Highlands. I think this is why we need to be a lot more careful about the siren call of the nation. And I'm not saying, to be very clear, I'm not saying that we ought to reject the traditions 
and communities and cultural practices that we are fond of, that give our social lives meaning, that make us happy. I'm not saying that at all. Hang on to that. That is part of your heritage. What I'm saying is that none of these things correspond with the borders of a particular political unit. It's that last bit, that final bit, that is the fiction. The political <coughs> dimension of belonging, as if belonging can be contained within borders. It can't. It transcends borders. It crosses borders. The nation isn't your friend. It really isn't. It's a political unit. And I think it is precisely for that reason it has to be relentlessly resisted in, the, in favor of the far more universal values of solidarity, amity, and compassion. Thank you very much.